Hi, everybody, and welcome to the best little horror house in Philly. I'm your host, George Heffler, and this is the show where we talk about the best horror movie ever made, according to our guest, at least. And today's guest is horror aficionado, James Kroll. How you doing, James? Oh, not too bad. Uh, I might shy away from assigning any titles like aficionado, but I appreciate the benefit of the doubt for sure. Definitely, definitely. Now, for those of you who uh, recognize the last name, James <laughs> is actually uh, Joe Kroll's brother. Joe was the guest that we had on to talk about uh, the movie Green Room. And when James saw that, he said, I have to set the record straight. <laughs> he re- reached out to make sure that, uh, that we could talk about the actual best horror movie ever made. So I'm, I'm definitely excited to have you on here today, James. Uh, it's, it's a genuine pleasure to be here, and 1,000%, that is exactly how that conversation went. <laughs> I am told by many that our voices sound nearly identical over recording as well, but you can also <laughs> differentiate me by my nickname, uh, the distressed show guest, who some say is too excitable <laughs> to keep on track. <laughs> They're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we'll be able to make it work, because I'm, uh, I'm pretty all over the place myself, so... Uh, I'm curious. We obviously heard about Joe's history with horror, and I imagine that you guys probably have a pretty similar kind of experience with it just because you were brought up together. But I, I'm curious if you want to just kind of walk us through how you got into horror, um, what makes it appealing to you, that sort of thing. Well, it's kind of funny, honestly, because I was thinking about that in uh, in preparation for the episode, and I was kind of trying to nail down the point where it, it went from revulsion to attraction, you know, because like, Joe being an avid Stephen King reader, I remember having those books around all the time. I used to get into staring contests with the spine of It because it had <laughs> Pennywise on it, uh, just because it freaked me out. So I'd like sure. lock eyes with it for minutes at a time before fleeing. <laughs> Um, and I, I remember when a buddy of his brought over Resident Evil 2 for the first time and it scared the hell out of me and I saw It. I think I, I want to say it was like six. I was probably closer to eight, uh, but I didn't sleep very well for about two weeks after that. But at a certain point, I don't know, it, it kind of turned around on me and seeing things like, you know, Juon and like Alien and like Aliens, a couple other movies, at a certain point, it just kind of became my favorite genre. And it's now gotten to the point where anybody who knows me, anybody else who plays like video games and stuff knows that you can pretty much tag me in at any point in any of the Resident Evil games. And I can tell you where you should go based on where you are right now. Like it's, I spend a great deal of my time doing stuff like this. And so it's, at some point, it uh, it really ingratiated itself into my life. And I, I fell in love with, you know, gothic horror stuff like, you know, vampires, werewolves. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of the tabletop game World of Darkness, but it's basically Edgelord D&D. Uh, <laughs> sounds, which hey, is, that sounds great. <laughs> it, I'm not going to lie to you. It's pretty amazing. But uh, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's become a, a part of my identity, but I'd be lying if I told you I could pinpoint the, the point in time when it 180 on me. A lot of people who wind up in uh, being into horror, I find even when they're like, oh, I, I can't watch it, I can't watch the movies or anything, do have that fascination with it. It, it kind of has that forbidden appeal to it, where they're like, oh, it's so scary, but I, I need to have the staring contest with it and see how long I can look at it. And that definitely seems to be a pattern that I'm finding that I, I think is really interesting. Yeah, I, I guess it's it's a recognized psychological like process or event. Like it, it, the reason I use those words is because it, it's either the revulsion attraction paradox or the revulsion attraction cycle in that something that should by all accounts drive you away like slasher films or you know whatever grisly stuff you see on the screen because it is so off-putting it also brings you to it and we'll go over this like when we're talking about some of my favorite stuff in this movie I'll be like I love this specifically because it makes me uncomfortable definitely I think that's definitely part of the appeal of of not just this movie but is is something that every horror fan definitely connects with for sure you've you've mentioned your love for the Resident Evil franchise. That's really, uh, that's awesome. I love those games as well. I mean, it's a little cliche to be like, oh, Resident Evil 4 was a game changer for me. But it's it's amazing how much influence the Resident Evil franchise uh, has really had uh, on people growing up, especially people in our general age. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I've definitely fielded those those comments before people think, well, Glory 4 totally killed the, the horror <laughs> of the series. Like, well, you're kind of right, but it's, you yeah. know, I wouldn't consider it any different from the the segue from Alien to Aliens. You know, Alien exactly. is a very much a, claustropho- a claustrophobic horror film, and then Aliens is action horror, and right. it's kind of the same thing. And frankly, I've just been loving these <laughs> remakes they're coming out with. I, I waited for RE2 make for literally like 16 years, and it was every bit as good as I wanted it to be, and I already pre-ordered 3 make. 
Yeah, it's great. I mean, it. that's the thing is, as long as they keep being good, I'm fine with them just reusing these same games and being like, all right, here's the updated version. Uh, go ahead and uh, go wild. And honestly, I'm hopeful that with stuff like 5, where it maybe had some fun elements to it, like a lot of people really like the co-op in 5, but there mm. is some stuff in it, you know, some story elements and things that people didn't like or some uh, clunky gameplay moments. And I'm hopeful that games that maybe didn't have the exact execution that was perfect are going to be able to uh, be changed for the better by them doing these remakes. So mm -hmm. uh, very hopeful about that. Yeah, you'd really hope that even if something is a failure, you can still learn from it. I mean, as long as we're talking cliches, there's there are certainly elements of Five that I that I really enjoyed, even if like the main campaign isn't really part of it. But it did it did some stuff that was that was really really cool. I like the co-op element of it and. That to me is probably the best iteration of the Mercenaries mini game, mainly because you get to play as Albert Wesker, who is kind of my guy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how can you how can you beat that? So I'm, you are a big fan of Resident Evil. You uh, picked the movie that we're going to be talking about. Uh, you seem to have sort of an affinity for uh, Japanese horror. I'm curious: is uh, J horror, as it's sometimes called, is that uh, your favorite subgenre, or do you not really? Uh, pin yourself down in that way uh, I'm curious about kind of where you land this is actually one of the first things that I was talking about with Joe when we when we talked about me doing an episode because I told him this is my favorite movie uh, I definitely want to um, address I, I, I don't know if your user base has has much of this but I definitely want to address the matter of the weeb wars so yeah no I definitely have a, a fascination with with eastern culture in general uh, I do speak Japanese it's pretty terrible my, my Mandarin is actually a thousand times better but like there's only like four anime that I watch like period and I actually prefer dubs. I don't have any wall scrolls, and uh, I can't. I, I have not even had a one pocky in at least <laughs> ten years. But to your question, my favorite kind of horror is uh, is the psychological kind of stuff. I can appreciate a good slasher movie, but I don't know if you know being born in the early '90s, kind of after its heyday, meant, meaning by the time that I was reaching maturity, it wasn't really a thing anymore. I, I don't really go for the you know the the predator prey aspect of a lot of horror you find in the west or did find in the west when this came out which was like 2002 2003 there's a lot more appreciation for stuff that kind of screws with your head a little bit more whether that's you know anachronic order or unreliable narration similar tropes um and i, I found an early appreciation for j-horror and c and k horror as well actually my my number two choice was a korean film very early on i found a heavy association with movies that were that were more likely to try to kind of screw with you on the other side of the screen and make it seem like your senses or your memory of events is, is lying to you and presenting a threat that isn't like scary monster that you can fight whereas more just this malevolence that hates you in a very passive aggressive kind of way which I think this movie does very very well. Definitely I think that uh, two things that I want to respond to in that because I think that you put a lot of really interesting uh, thoughts out there. First off I totally agree that uh, I was also born in the early 90s so a lot of the slashers that we got were kind of in response to the actual wave of slasher horror that had come out previously. So a lot of the stuff that we would have had growing up would have been stuff like Scream and I Know What You Did Last Summer and stuff like that, where it kind of requires a general knowledge of the stuff that came before it. I know when I started getting into slashers, I definitely had to reach backwards um, in order to find examples that I liked and, and were a good way to get into it. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's a really interesting point that you bring up about uh, maybe that having an influence on why it was something that uh, never really uh, stuck with you. Uh, I also wanted to comment on the fact that uh, you were talking about the way that uh, Eastern horror kind of uh, changes compared to Western horror. And I also really, I noticed it in this movie. It's something that I've seen in a bunch of different uh, Eastern movies, not necessarily just horror stuff, um, but movies like uh, Parasite, which recently came out. There's a really interesting kind of genre blending that happens in movies from places like Japan, places like South Korea, that they are it seems like they're less afraid to get boxed in. You know, they, uh, it, even in this movie, it seems like it has several different kinds of horror uh, movies that like are subgenres that it could have fallen into in different uh, points. You get your, oh, sorry. Also, I should say 
Uh, we're talking about uh, Juon, uh, the Grudge. <laughs> I just <too>. realized. <laughs> <laughs> wow, we really got like stuck in the library having a very philosophical discussion. Yeah. I completely forgot about the whole point. <laughs> yeah, so so uh, we're talking about Juon, the the Grudge too. And in this movie, uh, at one point, it has kind of a found footage kind of look to it. Uh, at another point, it becomes very much a, a a psychological like detective thriller where they're doing stuff like Zodiac, where they're just like uh, transcribing diaries and copying pages. And I'm like, yeah, that's my shit right there. <laughs> oh, we're going to get to that scene. And I'm not going to lie to you. That whole point there with those characters and the shit that happens there. Yeah. Literally my favorite seven minutes of this entire movie. Well, there you go. So we'll, I will <laughs> definitely get into it. And I just think that it's really interesting the way that they kind of hop around, I've noticed, in these movies that I've watched, at least in my experience, uh, a lot more than American movies, which stick very rigidly to their genre, unless they're specifically trying to subvert it. I definitely agree with that. I, I don't think, I mean, it's kind of a douchey term, but like the whole anachronic order thing. You know, like I said earlier, I wasn't seeing that done as much uh, with, with Western films back in the time when I discovered this movie. Um, and I, I would not go so far as to say that that's a, you know, a distinctly foreign thing, because it's not. But I, I do find it a little more prevalent in foreign films. Uh, I'm, I'm not as up to date on modern Hollywood releases. Maybe they're doing it more often than I realize. But I think for the most part, if you asked your average American, like, who their favorite director that does movies out of chronological order uh, through the viewing, I think the first person and maybe the last that normal people would go to would probably be Tarantino. I, don't, I can't think of many other directors who've made a name for themselves kind of doing this in medias res and then going forward and backward in time as the, as the plot decides. Yeah, I definitely think that it happens more in sort of melodramas than horror, especially in, a, uh, in American films, where you'll kind yeah. of see like a, a relationship disintegrating and then going back to the beginning of the relationship and that sort of thing. But I definitely take your point. That's a really good uh, point out because I, I I bet money that the whatever that new movie is with um, Scarlett Johansson and Adam Driver is probably Marriage does story. just exactly that. Yep. That's it. Yeah. yeah, I'll bet you it does just exactly that. It certainly um, does. <laughs> you, you don't sound too enthused. <laughs> uh, I listen. A lot of people love that movie. <laughs> I don't care for Noah Baumbach. I think that he is. Wes Anderson without the heart. He's a cynical jagoff who gets off on his own intellectualism. And uh, he's not for me, let's say. <laughs> oh, you know, you don't like intellectual masturbation. I have some bad news about this guest spot for you. Well, that's okay. As, <laughs> listen, as long as it's not presented in quite the way that he does it, I think I'll be able to manage. So Certainly not intentionally, but you're not the first person I've heard to have those, uh, those feelings. I heard somebody say that it, it, it kind of, that, that film, if we can do a little side commentary, that film kind of rang like a, a, a divorcee telling very much his side of a, of a divorce story. And that, you know, it, it didn't resonate with some people because of it. I haven't seen it myself. I don't know. Yeah, no, it, it definitely rings that way. And I mean, the real problem with me is that it's so obviously a stand in for his own life that when he gives uh, Adam Driver, who is representing him in his own divorce his, his stand in yeah yeah it it like he gives him a couple of obvious flaws but they're none of them are really bad enough to be like it's obvious that he's like oh look he's not perfect i'm not perfect but you should all be on his side and like it's it, it, it's very much uh he seems up his own ass to me so the, the token fault admission where the only one with exactly. fatal flaws is the other side yeah of course yeah That's so true. There's your review of the worst Best Picture nominee ever made, <laughs> Marriage Story. <laughs> now let's get to why we're actually here. Yes, exactly. So <laughs> we're talking about uh, Juon, The Grudge 2. This is a 2003 movie. Like you said, 2002, 2003, kind of, uh, I found conflicting reports. Uh, mm, movie, so right. Yeah, it, it doesn't help the fact that it is directed video called uh, V Cinema. So, you know, it kind of just sprung up. <laughs> But, yeah, uh, I owe you an uh, I owe you an apology. I didn't realize this was actually the fourth. I'd forgotten more accurately. This was the fourth movie in the series. Uh, I stand by that you don't really need to have heard any or read, watched any of the ones beforehand, which is just as well because I think this was the second theatrical release, but it's the fourth movie overall in the Joan series, and then they rebooted it, and there were three more after this, which are pretty poorly received. <laughs> yeah, well, so so let's let's get into this. So this one is written written and directed by Takashi Shimizu. I believe I'm saying right. that right. Uh, yep, you got and, it. And so this is 
part of the most confusingly titled franchise that I have ever personally <laughs> encountered. And oh, yeah. it's worth noting that I actually watched the wrong movie first. I, oh. <laughs> I watched and took notes on Juon The Curse 2 <laughs> yeah. and then realized that, in fact, the franchise goes... Uh, there are two short films, Katsumi and 444444444. That's followed by... Jew Own the Curse and Jew Own the Curse 2. Yep. Those are both VOD. Yep. And then <laughs> those those are followed up by Jew Own the Grudge and Jew Own the Grudge 2, both theatrical. But after Jew Own the Grudge, it splits off into the American remakes, also written and directed by Takashi Shimizu. And on top of all of that, so you have all of these various ones that are named similar things, the literal translation of Juon is Curse Grudge. So you have yep. Curse Grudge, The Curse 1 and 2, and Curse Grudge, The Grudge 1 and 2. Yep. <laughs> and it's just this path with his, th his path with this franchise is just so fascinating to me. And it seems like it's possibly unique the way that he directed the remake of his own movie for an American audience and then continued to work on a different, unique storyline that fleshed out from that way while also maintaining uh, the story in his own uh, home country as well. Really just remarkable. But it, it's also interesting because he, in Juon the Curse 2, it's really kind of like Juon the Curse 1.5 because yeah. it reuses, I believe like 45 minutes of the 70 something runtime is reused footage from the first movie. So there's just so many little things where it feels very much like this is such a passion thing for him where he's like, I need to be the steady hand on it. I need to be the one who gets it right. I need to keep coming back to it until it's perfect. He also directed and wrote the video game of Jew on the Grudge. Oh yeah, on the Wii. Yeah, so he really <laughs> is all over the place with this thing. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. I, I think... I think we've all kind of noticed, especially like those of us that were kind of born the, the time you and I were, when exports were just kind of really starting, that the original titles of the series are a little, um, they kind of fall victim to the vagaries of translation, because uh, translation's obviously gotten a lot better the more that we've done it. The closest thing to a translation of these movies was The Grudge and The Grudge 2, obviously, but I don't even think there were official sub jobs. Like, there was actually no export of this film, and any version of it you watch, I think, is a fan sub. And so that, that Juon curse Jew on the grudge it's just i feel like him kind of grasping at straws to kind of try to maintain the original identity of his movie as it was brought over to other shores because i mean the the actual phrase Jew on you see this a lot in in cynic languages like chinese or japanese especially chinese you when you have a word more often than not it's not just one ideograph it's two put together like you've, you've heard the old saying that like uh, the chinese have the same word for crisis as they do for opportunity it's actually not true they, they have two completely different words for those, but the word for crisis is made up of the word crisis with the word opportunity appended onto it. And so you kind of have the same thing. You have curse and grudge put together to make their own idiosyncratic meaning to the language itself. And when you transliterate it, it doesn't really work very well. It'd be more accurate almost to say like curse of the grudge or, you know, curse from beyond the grave Got it. so it becomes it becomes its own unique phrase when you combine them right and i think th the fact that they didn't translate it was still jew own when you see you know fan censor or english versions of the movie then they have to append another title on the end of it and i can kind of appreciate taking curse first and then grudge second you can kind of see like a linguistic theming there but if you're coming into this like i imagine you were for the first time in 2020 with none of the familiarity ahead of time that would be really really off-putting and confusing and it, it does make for an interesting web yeah it, it was interesting i wound up watching so i'm not the type to come into something with uh, without doing a little background and so i thought to myself oh i'm watching Jew own the curse too let me watch Jew own the curse one first <laughs> so i wound up watching Jew own the curse Jew own the curse two and Jew on the grudge two so i now have a pretty good grasp on <laughs> at least a pretty good amount of this franchise <laughs> so <laughs> it wound up working out for the best i did enjoy the first the two movies that i watched that weren't this one so you know at the end of the day it was kind Kind of a happy accident but it mm -hmm. definitely was a, a shock to me when i went back to look at our emails and realized it was a different different title 
<laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm curious if I can ask, and you don't, you, you, this can be off the record if you'd like, but I remember one of the first responses I got from you, in, including the phrase, I'm extremely curious to hear why this is your favorite. I'm interested to know if that's after having watched the wrong film and just being like, seriously? No, it, it was, uh, that was before. I mostly just find it really interesting when people choose sequels to be their favorite because, I mean, we'll, we'll kind of talk about this at the end. I usually, I usually ask people this question, but I am curious about your reasoning in terms of, I try to put myself in the shoes of someone who is trying to say that this is not the best horror movie ever made. And to me, of course, somebody who's trying to do that would say something like, how can this possibly be the best when it has to build on so much that's already established? And if you don't have that background knowledge, does it still hold up in a way that it could still be considered, quote unquote, the best? You know, we can just talk about this now. Do you think that this works outside of the, the franchise and that's why? Or you just think that this is kind of the culmination the peak of this franchise that you happen to love? Quick answer, honestly, both. Um, Fair enough. <laughs> Fair yeah, enough. We'll, we'll expound on that, assuming we're all not tired of hearing me by that point. I, I only ask because I'm, I'm eternally ready for people to, you know, I, I try not to be somebody who gets like offended when people don't like the same things. Mm -hmm. I mean, so there is that side where I just read, I'm really curious to know as like, wow, I mm, just somehow for you, I'd like to hear why. <laughs> no, no, hey, uh, outside of the kayfabe of the show, I definitely really enjoyed this one. Definitely not the way that it was intended. I also, I thought it was funny when I was doing some research into this, that uh, the Grudge series supposedly sprang forth from the director's own fear of both ghosts and a dance troupe that he saw perform who painted their nude bodies white. <laughs> he was just like, yep, that scared me. So they're all going to be white now. He also noticed the rise in domestic violence crimes in Japan while he was developing his movie Blue Tiger. Uh, and yeah. so he incorporated that into it as well. And these kind of three areas of his fear gave birth to Juon the Grudge and uh, related films. Like I mentioned, the first two movies were quote unquote V Cinema, the terms for movies that went direct to video, but it did receive a lot of acclaim via word of mouth uh, because of the spooky and minimalist atmosphere and a willingness to show the ghosts. I have talked in the past about how much I like when horror movies hold back on showing stuff. I know that Jaws is basically like the ultimate example of holding back. Alien does this a lot as well. But it's interesting to me that for ghost stories, it works so much more the opposite way. And I, I'm, I don't know, I don't even know for my own opinion, if I think that this is because it's not, it's just a human most times. It might be like a human who's been messed up or is bloody or something. But nine times out of 10, a ghost is just a human shape. So you don't have right. the, su the surprise of being like, oh, what is it going to be? Like, I have this suspense of waiting for this monster to show up. You don't really have that same kind of thing. So with a ghost story, I feel like you're waiting for them to show up and actually do their thing in a way that maybe you're not with more uh, like creature features sort of things. Well, it was kind of interesting uh, to your to your point about getting to see the monster. This is this is one of the things that I really really like about this movie is as opposed to a lot of other films, both western and otherwise. You know, usually the monster you don't really see the monster until the end of the film because it's it's true that generally something loses how scary it is once you finally know what it looks like because fundamentally, not knowing is more frightening because your brain is free to kind of make up whatever scares it just whatever scares you the most but i really like how this movie and again it's probably because this is the first movie i personally saw that did this i like how in this movie you have multiple long unflinching looks at the monster as she kind of does her thing uh there's there's no quick flits you know in the corner of your eye and she and she hits real fast and then the scene's over you can't really tell what's going on like no you see this chick coming almost literally from a mile away and she takes her time and the uh, the actress Takako Fuji who who plays Kayako is is really impressive she can actually contort like that herself even on the stairs there's no wire work or anything but the only affectation they put on it is kind of changing the the playback speed so she's moving really fast as she's twisting at one point and then back to normal and then fast again and then kind of back to normal but one of my favorite kills I guess you get like straight 90 seconds of of Kayako doing her thing and it's like it's it's fun but it's not fun <laughs> like it's it's rough 
I think it's an interesting study how like I don't think in the West we have different like breeds of ghost. You know what I mean? Like if I if I threw a bunch of English words for you like white or spirit, specter, whatever, I don't think you have a given image for what each one of those looks like. But Japan does, you know, like a, a yude is just like a basic ghost, but an onryo is specifically a ghost born of vengeance. Um, and I also find it kind of cool that in a Western flick, you know, a, a vengeance ghost would come back, would wreck shop on the person that wronged them, and then either dissipate or, you know, be held here because it's it's consumed by its own rage, et cetera, et cetera. But pretty much by and large, the, the onryo in Japan, it's not just, I'm going to kill the guy who killed me. It's, I'm going to kill the guy and I'm going to kill every single other person that I can get my hands on because I'm pissed and I'm dead as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. I would assume, but I don't know for certain if that has something to do with Japan's general culture of collectivism, you know, burden of one shared becomes the burden of all, where we're more individualist over here. So, you know, come back, objective done, and then leave. I'm not really sure, but I, I find it interesting and it kind of leads to that. I'm going to keep saying this, that, that passive aggression that makes this so interesting to me. I really love the long kind of lockdown shots where they are just getting approached by these ghosts. It really kind of puts you in the shoes of like, wow, I'm paralyzed with fear. Like, uh, there is no yeah. thing. I also, I think that the kind of contortion that you mentioned is really remarkable. She does a really great job. It's really kind of grotesque looking, <laughs> in a really impressive way. And this is the kind of thing that I, I shouted out in the Train to Busan episode where that kind of unnatural movement just gets under your skin in a way that I can't explain. It's really great. And it does a lot of really great work in this movie as well. That kind of uh, editing where they put, kind of put the, the affectation of the fast speed and slow speed, it's used really well here. And it's kind of, you can see its most extreme example, I think, in the Saw franchise, where it's, I, I hope that at some point I don't have to recant this for a Saw episode, but truly one of the worst editing things that I have maybe ever seen is the like Saw saw mode where people will be like in a chair strapped and their head will shake around and there's kind of like after images and it's like at weird speeds. And it's like this great effect turned up to 11 and it just loses all of the effect that it has in terms of scare and just becomes like a frenetic energy thing. It just becomes a sensory overload as opposed to something like this where you, it, it's used as kind of an accent. Uh, it improves mm -hmm. the thing that the scare that's already happening instead of just being like, whoa, somebody's head is moving around fast. That's scary, I guess. Yeah, it's it's more of a it's like a garnish rather than a, a different plate. Although I, I'm curious, if, if, if put this on an extreme, I haven't seen Saw in a while, so maybe it's the same thing. But if you want to consider Juon over here on the the least extreme, with just you know occasional half second bursts of slightly sped up footage, mostly with normal, uh, and then what I assume to be Saw in kind of the center with what you're describing. Where do you? Because I don't find that very frightening either myself. But I'll tell you what does screw with me is what you see in Jacob's Ladder when they have the under cranking while they're filming it and then when you play it at normal speed they have that insane kind of whipping and like i maybe that is what they do in saw but i, I found some of the stuff they did with you know like the, the people in the subways that goes by uh in jacob's ladder to be genuinely upsetting and like that that does get to me is that the same thing you see in saw and if not what do you think of that it's similar i think that there are definitely like there's a sliding scale of it and if this is at the one end then slightly above it would be something like Mandy, which has kind of, uh, it uses some stuff like that in some of the trippy aspects of that film where you're more, uh, he's drugged and stuff like that. So it, it kind of has a reason to be in there. And then Jacob's Ladder would be like the three quarters mark. And then uh, some of the later saws would be the 100. And, and definitely I think oh, wow. that, in certain examples, uh, it, can, it can be used to affect, even in the Saw movies, you know, there are times where it's used in a way that I'm like, okay, that's actually okay. But they really just hammer it home over and over. I mean, it's in like every single one after three, several times. So. Oh, she's. <laughs> yeah, it's, it gets to be a lot. So I, I digress though. It, it, let, needless to say, I like it in this one. And uh, I like it because it's kind of toned down. As we mentioned, this is presented non-linearly. It has like over, overlapping vignettes. People who listen to the Trick or Treat episode uh, will be kind of familiar 
with that kind of format. It's very similar. We're going to talk about the plot, the way it's presented, although people who are interested in finding the timeline and chronology put together for you already, I mean, it's out there. Just look at like the Wikipedia article, honestly. Um, yeah, for sure. So it seems like this is something that you're really into. You, it, you like movies where you kind of have to do a little work in terms of uh, assembling it all in your mind and, and figuring out exactly what happened. I think the advantage to it often, and I don't know if this is all in media as I haven't actually like dedicated the time to think about it, but I think what it really allows you to do is, have you ever heard of the expression uh, in games, uh, time to create? Uh, it sounds familiar, but I, I can't say it well enough. And plus, let's just go, go into it for the, for the audience. I mean, yeah, <laughs> Sorry. exactly. No, no, uh, I know, but just for people who don't. <laughs> uh, okay, so basically, like in games, time to create is how long from the time that I hit new game do I get to a box full of goodies in a video mm. game? And I, I think this is kind of analogous in movies. An advantage that this sort of storytelling method does is it allows you to shorten the time to create where create is scarce. Mm. You, can have, you can have an event happen where... Here's your characters, tango, 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 everything's fine. And then, oh, some, some, some bad shit goes down and then you know, your nerves go up and it doesn't just have to be a throwaway. Like you, you see this a lot in slasher films where like a couple of randos who we are never going to get to know are walking down a forest road and then Jason's like, I'm here and murders the shit <laughs> out of them. And then we get to the real plot. Right. This or just like a cat jumps, jumps out. Like, so yeah. yeah, you get those classic fake outs where you're like, it's obviously too early for a real kill to happen. <laughs> like, we need time to get to know these characters. And then it, it, it does lessen the impact of a lot of that early stuff. So I think this is a really salient and interesting point that you're making here. So you get to that crate faster, but if you do it this way, you at least get to have those same characters and then you can kind of tell their story around it. So retroactively, that scene means even more than just like spooky ghost child happening. We'll, we'll talk about that before too long. Yeah. So, yeah. So let's start getting into it then. Uh, so we have several vignettes. Uh, the first one is Kyoko. And if I mispronounce a name, feel free to correct me. No problem. Uh, Kyoko. And I only say that because Kyoko, uh, Kyoko and Ka uh, Kayako are going to get real confusing. Yeah. All right. So Kyoko. <laughs> all right. Right. So the first vignette is Kyoko's. Uh, the movie opens up with a drive. This is a classic way to start a movie. And it was something I was really thinking about how a drive really... It's a confined environment. It allows them to talk about what just happened to them. You can focus on exactly the dialogue. You don't have to worry about a ton of other stimulation. You get a little bit to learn about what these people are like, their relationships, their attitudes, that sort of thing. And I was like, man, this cars are really just a great way to get to know your characters at the beginning of a movie. Yeah, it's, it's a literal microcosm. And I, yeah. I, I want to tip my hat because that's way more in depth than my first thought every time I see this. Because uh, this story is deliberately, is, is explicitly said to be in Tokyo. I don't care what time of day you're driving in Tokyo. No road is that empty. I don't care how far <laughs> out of the suburbs you're getting. I, I thought that was kind of ridiculous. Fair enough. Hey, I, I don't know the traffic <laughs> patterns, but I know roads like that. 76 on in Philadelphia is very much the same way. You could be driving home at 10 p.m. and you'll have an hour's worth of traffic on it. So I, I only bring it up because I think it's important to love what you love, warts and all. And if you can laugh at something, even when it's unintentional and still love it, I think that's I think it's all the better for it. Uh, and so, like I said, we get a little bit of time to get to know these characters. We have uh, Kyoko, who is the so-called horror queen. And she's grumpy about being pigeonholed like this. We also learn that she's pregnant and set to be married to the driver of the car, Masashi. There is some very naturalistic shooting of the car from behind and from the side. Really interesting way of, of filming this. And it really makes it feel like a spirit instead of a camera. It's something that I think is probably like just a happy coincidence for people who are making ghost movies. But when you have that kind of wobble to the camera, it makes it feel much more POV and like a spirit. And you can have it with unnatural eye lines for a ghost and still have it, you know, utilize that kind of perspective that I think is really interesting. And they do it well here. Yeah, now, that's really clever. Yeah, I, I, I just think I, I like little, uh, little tricks like that. I think that this does a lot of stuff like that. Really interesting little tricks that wind up working to the movie's benefit. The car screeches to a stop because they hit a cat. R.I.P. I'm a big cat fan. So this was a, a real bummer right at the top. Yeah. Then, rip, rip, rip in peace, little buddy. Yeah, exactly. And uh, Masashi, he's the driver. He gets out to check and he's like, all right, we need to get out of here. He runs back to flee the scene. <laughs> 
but uh, Kyoko looks back and sees ghostly pale legs. They drive off, and all of a sudden, the cat body is gone. They don't see it, but we see it. Yeah. And they're driving away. Kyoko, or Kyoko looks down uh, into, like, the pedal area, and Toshio, little, little ghost boy, is just hanging out in this little uh, pedal area, and he <laughs> reaches up and he yanks on the t- on the wheel and he makes the car swerve off the road. It's funny because exactly to your point about time to crate, this is this is great right away. Like it's the movie is only a couple minutes in and you've already seen a ghost and he's already crashed the car. The two main uh, two main characters. So uh, I think that that was it's really interesting to see. In the wreckage, we also see a great shot where the palm prints kind of show up on the windshield. It's very unsettling. And Kyoko looks down while she's in the car, and she appears to have miscarried. Yeah, uh, that, that's the, the, to, to your point about the handprints, the, the squadging sound as they form and kind of mm-hmm. crawling up the car is, is definitely off-putting. Uh, and just a, another thing I thought was kind of funny, like, I, I think this movie is, is really talent, talentedly done and they did it with a really low budget, which I appreciate. We can visit that later on. But like, I love how the outside of the car is fine. <laughs> like inside, inside they're surprisingly busted up. <laughs> it's yeah. like, yeah, okay, ghost powers, why not? Yeah, no, they're like, uh, we can't afford to buy another car. So if we need to reshoot this, we can't actually break it. So. <laughs> what about the actors, sir? Oh, definitely throw them around a little bit. They'll be fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we're shooting in a hospital, so they'll be fine. Yeah, for real. <laughs> um, and so speaking of, we cut to the hospital. There's a really great shot here where the family leaves and Kyoko is just kind of staring into the distance. But she's been through so much in a short amount of time. And her kind of despondence there is really palpable. It's a, a great physical performance at this point. And I, I really just wanted to shout it out. Yeah, no, I, I really like, I think she's a really good choice for this role. I think she's a really talented actress. And I, I don't recall seeing her in a lot of other stuff at the time. But I, I do hope that she had a, had a successful career because she does even when she's not speaking, she really sells the roles really well. She's upset, but beside the apparent miscarriage, Kyoko seems to be pretty unharmed. Uh, yeah. Counter this with Masashi, her fiance, who is in a coma. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's combed up real good. Yeah, and there's another really genuinely creepy scene right away where uh, Toshio stops Kyoko from entering Masashi's room. And he just kind of like, he holds her stomach and pushes her back a little bit and it's it's really unsettling toshio he is one of the characters that's persisted throughout all of these movies he is one of the one of the spirits that haunts the house that is this sort of uh like you mentioned one of the ghosts that not only wanted to take revenge on the people who killed him but also just basically messing up anyone who mess who steps into that house So him and his mother, Kayako, they're the two ghosts that kind of persist throughout the whole franchise. Right. I I really like what they did with him here. Uh, As I'm sure you've noticed if you watched the movies, he has a lot more of a major role in all the other three. And he becomes the main antagonist in the remakes, which is part of the reason I've avoided them. I like him a lot better here as kind of the support class to Kayako's assault. Like he's just kind of there in the background or he's around doing creepy stuff. We'll get to that, (laughs) I think, in the next vignette. He's never directly the, the one who murders anybody and i like that about him a lot personally because the kayak is a lot freakier and also just i don't know even a ghost it's kind of hard to be afraid of a you know <laughs> seven year old boy but at the same time this movie makes you terrified of an 85 pound japanese woman so That's true. maybe hey. i don't know what i'm talking about <laughs> <laughs> no i i definitely agree and i think that he's a lot better at just kind of like setting up the unsettling nature of it and then uh and then we get the real, the adult ghost coming in and, and messing people up. <laughs> Comes out of the ground like the adults are going to start talking now. <laughs> exactly. Go to your room, <laughs> Toshio. <laughs> and so Kyako is talking to her mom about the ghost that she saw and the miscarriage. She says that she believes that he was the spirit of the bait. And that's why she was sure her child was a boy breaking a generational habit of having girls. To her surprise, however, she later she finds out, the doctor tells her that she's still pregnant. Yeah. And, and that's certainly a shock, considering that she was bleeding in the car. And her mom also dies unexpectedly in the night. Yeah, I, I thought this whole scene was kind of interesting, just partially because at one point she's like, did you ever have any other uh, children that uh, 
died <laughs> that you didn't tell yeah. me about? And she's like, no, it's always been girls. I'm pretty sure yours was too. Like kind of reading her mind like, the ghost boy isn't yours. And <laughs> it was like, mm, pretty sure it is though. <laughs> It was. It is uh, an interesting scene, and uh, I, I like it. It is kind of a shock when she dies so early in the movie. <laughs> You're like, oh, I expected this to be like the support system throughout the entire movie. And I think that that's a really interesting way of like taking away her support and making her feel even more isolated and making you understand the situation that she's in. Mm-hmm. I, I was going to bring this up. Uh, I love the way this movie does isolation in general. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the cinematography is really, really good at it. it it's kind of hard to, to talk about as we're doing a rundown, but a lot of times when a character is alone and shit hasn't quite jumped off yet, but it's going to, a lot of times they're comparatively small in the frame and it's really zoomed out to accentuate you know how how powerless they are and how alone they are and how foreboding like even like an office like the scene that i that i love we're going to get to even just like an office itself can be really unsettling when you're by yourself and that that sixth sense that danger the, the hairs on the back of your neck start to go up and the i think the way it's shot really conveys that and i also really like how as you're saying the the general plot support structure of family and friends like husband's in a coma mom just died she is on her fucking own and there's something is super wrong with this little white child that is following her around like immediately she is put in this position of vulnerability and again we're 10 15 minutes into the movie at most yeah this is also the point where we get our first taste of that non-linearity we cut to the past and it's kyoko who's like in a school and it's just like sketchy as hell and she walks in mm-hmm. and then boom, right away, spooky ghost. And it's, yeah. funny, it's funny to me that we talked about how they don't, by using this nonlinearity, they can avoid having to use fake outs and stuff. But this actually is a great fake out. <laughs> this, is, this is not the real, it's not a real haunted place. It's a, a set. And I was genuinely like, where the hell is she? <laughs> Yeah. It really yeah. took me by surprise. There's there's really no signposting whatsoever. Like you you would swear that she was just walking down a different hallway in the hospital where Masashi is, where the fucking janitor just quit his job and left everything out and it was yeah. drafty and filthy. And then, you know, somebody's calling for a doctor and she says, Who's there? And it's like, It's you, it's your fault. And then the camera cuts around and there's a ghost we haven't seen before and she passes out. And then lights come on and then the staff start talking. It's like, oh, a TV show. Like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I liked it a lot. I think that it's a really good way of doing a fake out. I have mentioned that cat jumping out thing many times before, not just on this episode, because it is a particularly heinous use of the fake out that is in Friday the 13th, which is a series that I do have a very fond spot in my heart for. But God, I just really hate that cat jumping out nonsense. <laughs> But this is a really great fake out and we cut back to the present day. And I've mentioned this before, but I am notoriously terrible at paying attention to the score. But this movie, there's a really nice bit of score here where because there's not a lot of action happening, it's really kind of a character moment. You can really pay attention to this melancholy score as Kyoko goes home in the present and she sees her uh, wedding magazines kind of splayed out just some really nice music there Mm -hmm. yeah the the soundtrack is routinely brought up in discussions of one of the strongest points of the film and i i think it definitely is uh it deserves it even when when there are scares this movie doesn't do a lot of jump scares i love that but when there are scares there's not generally a scare chord there's one with homeboy in the car and i think that's it yeah and for the most part when things are going bad you know at most there's a very small string accompaniment to kind of get your tension up a little bit but it's it's never as overt as you see in a lot of its contemporaries and i love that about it it mostly leaves you alone to kind of minimize how much of the fourth wall there is to get you into it to immerse you yeah you're not you're not as scared by the music or surprised by the music as as you have to actually be scared by what's on screen. Yeah, John Williams isn't here to help you. Yeah, I, I think that this this is a real strong suit of this franchise in general. One thing that I was going to talk about when I thought we were talking about Ju Own the Curse 2 is that <laughs> the way that it's filmed, it kind of looks like it's on a TV set. Like it looks bad, but in a way that you're like, oh, this feels very real. Like it feels like someone went out with their VHS camera and like happened to see this stuff. And so this kind of utilization of things that aren't 
necessarily found in other in other horror movies like not using the stings to communicate the scares and using the technology that you have that is is maybe a lesser technology but using it to your advantage um i think that's something that's really prevalent in this franchise and something that i really admire about it as well Mm -hmm. yeah i I don't know i'm not really a expert on on how movies are done but i I would call it kind of naturalistic and that's not something you see very often yeah i think that it's it's in the technology use it like i mentioned before in just the shots that they choose when uh it's they're filming the outside of the car naturalistic is i think a great way to describe it there are a lot of additional fun little spooky moments at kind of the end of this vignette uh, as uh, kyoko is in her house Uh, She sees the ghost reflection in the door underneath her mother's blanket. Uh, Toshio is in there and he just loves hanging out in crevices. (laughs) Well, yeah, he's, he's actually, if I recall, he's, he's standing on top of her mother. He's he's real claustrophilic, but yeah, because that's, that's when she finds out that her mother has died. She closes the door and sees him looming over her. And then she's like, Oh mom, you okay? No, she's super not. (laughs) She's sure not. Okay. (laughs) Um, and so in, in this moment, that's kind of the end of this first vignette. And you get a bunch of good scares right away. It sets up the framing device of this movie. And then we get to see what led to this point. Just a really great way to start us off. Yeah, next, I dig it. The next vignette. And also I should mention that there are very distinct partitions. Title cards? Yeah, yeah. There are title cards, yeah. very distinct partitions between the vignettes. This is counter to a movie like Trick or Treat, which does something similar in terms of the asynchronic uh, storytelling, but that all kind of blends together with this. It's like, okay, this is uh, Tomoka's story. And so now we get to kind of be like, all right, we're going to follow this perspective, but still see the rest of the cast and understand like how it all comes together. Tomoka is in fact the next one yet. She is the host of the show that Kyoko was working on. When it cuts to this vignette, we go back to before Kyoko was on the show, however, looking at the production side of things. Uh, They say, hey, we're going to go to the grudge house, basically. That's that's what it boils down to. (laughs) You're just like, oh, bad idea, but... Genre blind. (laughs) The shot where Tomoka walks into her apartment that happens here after they decide this, and you just see someone hanging in the background is really scary stuff. (laughs) Like... It reminded me a lot of that rumor about the Wizard of Oz where the munchkin hangs himself, except it's actually there. And you're like, oh, wow, there's just a guy uh, hanging in the background there. Really scary. She doesn't see it, but she talks on the phone with her boyfriend, Nori, and she says that it's a corner apartment, but every night at around 1230, uh, there's several thumps behind the wall. And so he comes over. They see it happen. It's spooky. You know, like there can't be anything out there. I don't know what this thumping could be. And they say that they're going to investigate again the next night. And I want to point out how much I love this guy. Yeah. Uh, Nori. The way he walks into the door and it's that Nori Kundes. He's got, <laughs> he's got big 1990s X-Men cartoon gambit energy. And yep. I love that about him. <laughs> it's just such like a self-aggrandizing goofball in front of his girlfriend. It's the best. Uh, and I, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, when she first notices the thumping, she's kind of getting close to the wall where it's coming from and her teacup spills over apropos of absolutely nothing it's no, it's, it's by itself that. there's yeah there's there's nothing near it and it just jumps over just falls and then when the camera cuts to show it spilling the the note list that she's reading from her lines is not that anymore it's this it's a book with like handwriting in it and it's not what she was looking at prior and it changes right back a split second later when that cut ends i thought oh, that was kind man. of interesting i didn't even notice that's so cool i i love stuff like that where it's really quick and you have to kind of go back and you have the benefit of having seen this several times and I look forward to going back and really see it like picking up on a lot of these little things. And basically what happens is they're like, well, there's not really a lot we can do right now. So we'll investigate the next day. (laughs) We cut to that next night and uh, Nori is leaving her a message saying that he's here. He's going to head up to the apartment and they'll see her there. Uh, Unfortunately, this voicemail is interrupted by Toshio. I love the weird croaking that he does. (laughs) It makes me laugh so hard. I I don't, it doesn't seem like it's supposed to be scary necessarily, just like unsettling, but he's done it before. And every time it just makes people go like, what the hell is this crazy ass kid doing? And 
that kind of just unsurety is almost more scary than if he was just like, boo, I'm a scary ghost. Yeah, no, it, it does that thing where it kind of, it, it, it kind of sets your brain off track where you don't have a, like an ABC logic train. It's, uh, it's actually supposed to be uh, Kayako's noise does this and the cool meta stuff. Uh, Takashi Shimizu, the, the director actually does that voice himself. He, he makes that sound. Oh, wow. Um, and there, there is an in-universe explanation for it that we can go into later, but that's, that's kind of your heads up that like, you wouldn't know it first viewing, but that's your heads up if you know the series that like Kayako's about to get involved and shit's about to get real. Yeah, and, and shit does get real. This is, oh boy, does it. <laughs> this is probably my favorite scene in the movie. We cut away and we see, uh, we see Nori walk in and he's all casual, but there's someone in the foreground just babbling, terrified. It looked like it was his girlfriend yeah, it, to me, right? That's who it's yeah, supposed it's, to it's be? Yeah, it's Tomoka. She's, she's got her eyes locked on something, and she is clearly not having a good time. Yeah, she's, like, she's babbling and rocking back and forth, and it's really scary, and he sees her there, and then he gets a phone call from her, not yeah. the one in front of him, and <laughs> she says, hey, I just finished up. I'm on my way home. And oh, I'll see you there. And then we go back to him and we see that mm-hmm. the room is dark and this girl who was there is gone. Yep. <laughs> so it's really just, it shocked me. <laughs> it really did. And then yeah, it's, it's that you know, same thing as the croaking. It puts you off. Yeah. And also, I mean, this is just part and parcel of the time that it came out, but there is so much cell phone based horror in this franchise. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. So many times people are like, Oh, my cell phone is ringing. And like, oh, I'm going to, to have a scary message on it. That's, that's really heavily in the culture. Which I, I, you mentioned that the first movie in the series is four, 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 four. And like, that's, that's, that's a phone number. It's, yeah. it's a phone number. That's all for us. Cause four is, you know, an unlucky number in Japanese because it's pronounced the same way as death, right. um, which is what they invented a whole other word for it, which is cool. <laughs> yeah. This is so lame. You can cut this out if you want to, but I thought this was interesting because <laughs> you've heard, you know, Japanese folks answer the phone with mush mushy and it's the same word repeated twice. And this might be apocryphal, but apparently the reason for that is because in the old days, people would do that to prove that they're not a demon in disguise, like not a ghost impersonating somebody. They, they'd repeat a word one after the other because for some reason, ghosts and, and monsters of the time couldn't do that. So yeah. it's ironic to me. Like, oh, it's like, mush, mush. I'm tripped <laughs> up by the re- repetition. <laughs> <laughs> I can only do it once. God, <laughs> Damn so it, foiled it. again. <laughs> I'll just come at you from the car then. Yeah, so a lot of cell phone horror, but it really works, especially in this scene. And then something drops down behind him. We cut yep. away. And we see Tomoka coming in. And yep. uh, there's a, a cool shot where they show his shoes to indicate that he was there and it, uh, ostensibly is still there. But we see that, in fact, he was the hanging guy all along. And yep. it's not rope, it's hair. What the actual fuck? And he's yeah. swinging because Toshio is pushing him. And that's what's making the banging noise. And there's yeah, more and croaking feet. hair. It's like... <laughs> It's just so much happens. And it, the, the more hair comes and drags Tomoka up, she gets her friggin' ass killed too at 1227, the time when the bumps were happening. <laughs> yeah, she's thrashing around and it's their feet that's making the thumping noise. And it's, it's Nori's feet that knock over her teacup two nights ago when it hit. <sighs> this whole story is super timey wimey. And I, I totally don't understand anybody trying to watch this ending up firing it into the sun. But I am so here for this. Yeah, this scene really, this is the moment where I was like, I was enjoying it before, but this is when it really was, I was like, this works. This is working. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's a really great scene, and it's a great way to end that vignette. We kind of zoomed through it a little bit, but it's, it's a great time. Um, oh yeah well hopefully it'll encourage people to check it out for themselves exactly that's that's definitely something i want to do with this i don't want to go into too much detail because there's a lot of just like hanging out and just absorbing the atmosphere and like enjoying the scares and so there the plot is i mean it's there but it's not super heavy you're not like oh i need to get out the charts and and have family lineages and everything (laughs) like it's it, you don't have that same kind of trouble, so yeah, I, I really like that about. Yeah, you know? this is if if the plot is a book you're reading in the bathtub, this is you just soaking in your own filth in the tub <laughs> of the of the atmosphere and being able to do that more. <laughs> yep, exactly. We get another title card. The next vignette is uh, Megumi, 
who is the hair and makeup person for the show that they were working on. We see her talking to Kyoko, and she says that she watches all her shows, and supposedly a particularly scary one is the delightfully named Curse of the Sliding Door. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I know you mentioned that a lot of these are uh, fan subs just by the nature of their uh, very existence. I hope that that is what he intended because I think that's a fantastic name. It really makes me laugh. It's literally exactly what he's talking about. If, uh, if, if you wanted to, you could call it the curse of the self-sliding door, but it, wow. it makes it even funnier in English. So yeah. like, yeah, no, that's, that's the point. Make it a, do it a real good job, I hope, of, of making just the most mundane shit yeah, <laughs> and uh, there's another cool shot here where the camera pulls back and reveals that we're in the Grudge House. Yeah, it's, they're in the fucking house. Yeah, uh, I like this, and this is this is kind of the moment where I started thinking about how interesting the idea of this movie is. I like the Grudge franchise idea as a whole entity, but this particular movie really kind of nails what I think is interesting about the Grudge which is that it's kind of a self-perpetuating curse because the more people that die there, the more morbid investigators come and then they die. And then people are like, wow, this house is super haunted. And then they come and they die. And it just, it creates this feedback loop that I think is really interesting and is kind of what lends itself to having such a long running franchise. Yeah, I I think it's maybe that attraction revulsion cycle expressed in physical form, except in this case, it's more a curiosity murder cycle. Right. (laughs) Because it it is, it is that passive aggression. It'll, the, the curse comes after anybody who's related to anybody it's already involved with. Yeah, exactly. So there's a dark spot on the floor that Tomoka, or no, not Tomoka. Megumi. This is, yeah, that Megumi sees. And we kind of get a look at it. I did not realize that this is supposed to be a blood stain at first. I was just like, what the hell is that? But yeah, it's, it's a creepy dark blood stain on the floor. And then we get to see some of the filming happen. This is when uh, Tomoka, the girl that we saw before, who is the host, she says, many actresses are said to have a sixth sense, which is a line that really just cracked me up. <laughs> Like, yeah, on my rewatching, it got me too. Like, actresses are known for being able to feel things. I'm like, yeah. that's really specific, Japan. Like, Yeah, I, I imagine it has something to do with just, like, the empathy of being able to inhabit another character. But just, like, saying the way that it's phrased was really, uh, it made me laugh. And there are some glitches in the recording. And people are kind of getting a little nervous. Because obviously they know that this is supposed to be a haunted house. Uh, There's some weird sounds that they find, and the director, uh, Keisuke, says he'll check it out. This is where I mentioned that it kind of jumps around in style. There's, when they're filming, we get some creepy stuff in it, and this is like a found footage movie just hidden in the middle of this other movie. And I think it's pretty interesting. I don't normally love found footage, but getting a little taste of it is certainly something I can get behind. And I think it's organic here. Yeah, exactly. Like a lot of times... That, that, that question is always like, why are you still filming <laughs> when Godzilla is destroying the town? But like, this is like, no, literally, we're going to Spooky Place to film stuff in the Spooky Place. And then they, they kind of plant some seeds that'll pay off in a later scene, which I really appreciate. Yeah. So they're walking down the steps, they're talking, and the crew basically breaks to discuss their next plan of action. They're like, weird shit's happening. We got to check it out. Uh, let's talk about we're gonna, what we're going to do. Megumi and Kyoko kind of go off to the side and they're sitting down, and they discuss her hidden pregnancy, which it seems almost like Megumi has, she actually is the one who has sort of a sixth sense. The fact that she can see some of the blood stains and everything that have appeared, the fact that she just knows about this pregnancy, she says, oh, it's because I'm a woman, of course I know. But mm-hmm. uh, that seems like a load of hooey. <laughs> Well, yeah, no, because Keisuke specifically points out earlier when they're talking about the show during uh, Tomoka's segment, he's like, yeah, no, you kind of got like, you you feel things sometimes, you'd be perfect for this. And she's like, fuck you, I don't want to do it. And then later yeah. she's doing it. And she definitely does have those weird, because she's just that, that dark stain, she's the only one who seems to care about it. And then she just immediately nonchalantly is like, hey, you're pregnant, check it out. Mm-hmm. I have a charm for that. You take it. <laughs> Yeah. You're like, okay. <laughs> right, yeah. So she does, ha- she has an easy pregnancy charm on her phone and that she gives it to uh, Kyoko before walking away to join the rest of the cast. Now, Kyoko is sitting on the porch of this house by herself and we get a scene of Toshio and his family behind her. And 
this scene really also kind of creeped me out because I, first of all, it kind of has like a film grain applied to it, which makes it really strange to me and sets it off from reality. But they also seem to actually be there. Uh, Toshio reacts to her spilling her coffee or tea or whatever it is that she has and then is directly behind her. Like this would be yeah. creepy even if he was real. <laughs> like, like, it's somehow made worse by the fact that they're not they're not ghosts. Like it, it has that film grain, like it's the past playing itself out again, but they they're skin colored, like they're normal. They they're yeah. alive in this scene, and it's still him interacting with her because she spills it and comes back and he's standing right behind her. She never sees him. I might be jumping ahead of you a little bit, but it it looks like Megumi does because she's out hanging out with the cast and crew and she looks over and kind of locks eyes with right. the with the scene. And then Kyoko assumes that she's just looking at her. The way that they kind of has that the past and film interacting with the present really reminds me a lot of the movies Resolution and The Endless, which are, uh, I wouldn't call it like a direct sequel, The Endless to The Resolution, but they're definitely in the same universe. It happens after The Resolution and they do have some interplay, but it really, those movies have a lot of kind of investigation into the memory and the remnant that happens from putting something on film and uh, just some really interesting kind of out there theories and concepts that are in those that I highly recommend those movies. But it's, I mean, we see this in 2003, way mm. before those movies. And uh, it's really remarkable. I think it really works well here. It works well in the re in resolution and the endless. It's, it's a really interesting thing that I like a lot. I think it's really neat. And we have legends like that in real life too. You know, there are, there are stories of ghosts playing out their last moments, like, you know, signs of wars, uh, you know, the, being able to see the war happening with ghostly figures or, you know, the wild hunt in, in the sky in Scandinavia, stuff like that. I, right. I find that really, really cool. And I think it's kind of an underserved concept that I, I would definitely be down with seeing more of the whole psychic emanation leaves an imprint that repeats and repeats and repeats. Yeah, well, then I definitely recommend checking out uh, Resolution and The Endless. They're really great. So check those out for sure. And I've already written them down. <laughs> there you go. One other thing I want to mention about this particular moment is that I really love when the vignettes tie together in fun ways. This in particular reminds me of Trick or Treat. I know I keep making that comparison, but I really love that movie as well. And it does have no, a similar uh, asynchrosity. And you get to see people like saying stuff that you heard before. In this particular instance, we see Tomoka leaving the set and we hear her side of the conversation that she has with Nori. So just yep. kind of having that interplay, I, I really like that sort of thing a lot, especially uh, since this has the title cards. And so you don't necessarily get uh, as many opportunities for the transition like you do in Trick or Treat. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. I, I like how one scene kind of has jagged edges and then mm -hmm. a scene later will have edges that, that kind of fit in with it. And so yeah. on the one hand, you know, Nori answering the phone and you hear what she says, but then now you get to see her making that call and it's just, it's kind of neat. It, it, it ties together. Yeah. Um, if, if there's one thing I could point out that I really like, I find it kind of funny. Uh, when they're describing the murder that happened in the house, the exact phrase, is the the wife and child were dead in a deplorable way <laughs> um and that is what they say and i just want to point that out i love how japanese that is i don't I, i'm sure you 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 know the, the circumstances of Paco and toshio's death are explained in other movies but i find it extremely japanese to say nothing about the things that actually happened to the body to kind of keep it couched but to me i love the idea of a reporter being like they were found and it was it was awful and honestly kind of rude <laughs> a very cultural thing it's deplorable yeah. i don't care for it this offends me <laughs> seriously what the hell murderer have some class honestly who does that <laughs> um yeah I, I think that that is great and we get to follow megumi for a little bit longer she goes back in the house and she's cleaning up her supplies and she finds the photos from the original movie this is the kind of continuity that comes from a steady hand that controls the whole series it's something I love. It's part of why I really like the Child's Play franchise. Having Don Mancini and Brad Dorif as the main character and the director and writer of, those franch of that franchise allows it to keep a consistency that makes it possible for it to go into wacky and, and different story elements like uh, Seed of Chucky and Cult of Chucky and stuff like that. You know, it, mm -hmm. you maintain that heart that follows it through the whole thing. And that's 
this kind of attention to detail is is the kind of thing that can only happen when someone is you know has the passion for it that comes from being there the whole time yeah I, I like to think of it as a dividend that pays off on an investment that fans make by watching the older stuff like it's mm-hmm. it's there to be consumed for anybody watching it but if you do have that history if you put in the time beforehand it's this is just a little extra mint on your pillow that you get to enjoy and I, I i i'm right there with you i definitely dig it too and so she sees this scary photo where it's all cut up and like the faces are cut out um but then she cuts and she leaves without saying anything it makes you it really made me wonder like what she saw because i mean those are scary photos but you don't know if she like felt the energy off it you know we kind of see her have the sixth sense or what but we see her shadow pass outside and we find out that the camera was actually a POV shot the whole time as it ducks down behind the banister. This really, again, like I, I know I've said that a couple of things have kind of shocked me in this movie, but they really just keep surprising me. And that is part of what makes it such a great and interesting movie is that they do things like this where I was not expecting this to be a POV shot. And when it moved, I was, I flinched. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> this is, yeah, it's, it, it's really jarring and it, it works to its credit. Then we see Megumi again and she's in the studio now. And it's funny seeing her with all these wigs after we just saw the hair kill those other two. Yep. <laughs> and so I'm like, you're just waiting for something to happen, especially since they're facing the mirror. <laughs> it's yep. like, oh, dude, it's, it's worse than that. Did you notice that the exact one that she puts on the head, she kind of goes away and starts combing another one. There's a sliding shot and that exact wig that she put down has grown. It's way longer. Sw- yeah. It's much longer. And then in the next cut, it's back to normal. But it's I, like, I did notice that Whoa. it was very freaky. <laughs> and I don't like that at all. <laughs> yeah. And, and there's a lot of kind of wobbly POV seeming shots here. Very eerie. This mm. is, I think, the probably the one that you're talking about where there's kind of a, a sting on the score. And then we see another dark, uh, dark spot show up. It's another blood stain that shows up. To me, this is kind of like a funny, it feels like it's not a, as intense as, as you're expecting. And you're just like, oh, it's another blood stain. But then uh, the wig comes to life and becomes a whole lady who attacks her. <laughs> yeah, this... This is a really interesting one to me. Um, th- this scene super does it for me, but not all of it. And I could see how the first part not working would take somebody out of it. Because the wig kind of twitches in her hand as she's looking at this black spot that she recognizes from the house. It twitches and she throws it down. And so for the first 10 seconds, you know, the, the wig kind of moving looks really goofy. Yeah. But then in the space of about two seconds, it cuts back and you see the wig come out of the ground. And it's this contorting white skinned woman with blood all over that we haven't seen yet. And then that's when you get that long shot of her just kind of coming at you and Megumi not being able to do fuck all about it. It's, oh, that that second half of it is what gets me. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, she fucks her whole day up. She (laughs) she gets murdered hard, hard by it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Bad day, last day. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. And this is the end of her vignette. Next one up is Keisuke. Keisuke, yeah. We're back in present day now. And Masashi wakes up from his coma. Hooray. Uh, But he's mute and confined to a wheelchair. Less hooray. He's he's awake, but non-responsive. Yeah. It's uh, you feel bad for him. He really kind of got the short end of that stick in that car crash. (laughs) Um, But teach you to fall in love with an actress, I guess. He also was the one driving. So, you know, at the end of the day, uh, he does bear the responsibility. The ghost boy is going to crash your car. Yeah. It's definitely the driver's fault for letting the ghost boy crash your car. I'm with you. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) <laughs> um, and so Keisuke meets Kyoko at the hospital when she goes to see him uh, awake from his coma. And he tells her about the fate of the rest of the crew. And it's a, this is a really great performance as well. Uh, this kind of turned inward, sad, like telling her about what has happened to his crew. I mean, these are people that he worked with and liked and he has to communicate this to her and, and he's clearly scared and just a really great performance. It, yeah, you kind of realize along with him that he fucked up by going into that house and you can see him get more inwardly pressed and like despondent as he like just throwing names on a pile like he's gone. Haven't heard from this guy. She killed herself with her boyfriend. Like it's just oh, like, yeah. this, this went stu- spectacularly badly in a very <laughs> short amount of time. Right. And it is really I mean, it's it's his fault at the end of the day because he's the one who brought them there as the director. So 
definitely yeah. uh, you feel bad but he goes to drive kyoko home but they see the ghost of megumi disappear into her house yeah one thing that i really think is interesting about this movie is that the lighting in it is good but it's very dark and so you really have to look in and like you're leaning forward a little bit and it makes it extremely creepy in moments like when you're leaning in and Megumi is behind the partition and walks slowly up to hand Keisuke uh, the journal <laughs> before. Like, it's just really great lighting and it really kind of draws you in, which makes the scares that much more intense. Yeah, I really like the direction on her because they're walking up to the house and she's standing in like the corner of the gateway with her, with her hair, with her head kind of dipped down. And she doesn't look at him as she walks past, goes into the door, and as she turns around to close it, her head stays down, but her eyes come up and she locks eyes with them and closes the door. And to their credit, they're like, well, we're obviously going to go in and investigate that. When I feel like any other person would be like, fuck this, I'm out. Like, I don't want any part of that. <laughs> yeah. I guess if it's, if it's somebody you care about who you just heard went missing. Yeah. That's why. There's also, I want to mention that they do a really nice one-two punch with jump scares. Eh, not really jump scares, but with like just scary moments that happen. They kind of tend to put two in a row i've noticed in this franchise which is something that mm -hmm. i really like we see uh megumi is right behind her but then toshio walks up to the camera in the in this footage that they're watching and and then he pulls the light and she's right in front of him and then she disappears and the book drops which leaves the blood stain underneath it it's just like a lot of one like quick hits with the scares where you'll see you'll, like you said getting these kind of hints that something else is about to go down and kind of being like, okay, you can't relax just because you got scared. You can't be like, oh, all right, I have a little bit of time. Yeah, I, I think it's a really good refutement of the jump scare formula. You know, it's, you're supposed to build tension up and then you kind of release it in this one explosive moment. Whereas this movie kind of like, it'll, it'll hit your brain with a jab and then come in for two quick body blows, like one after the other. So you want to relax after that initial spike of adrenaline, but then it keeps coming and it, then you're afraid to relax ever again because you don't know until you start to establish the pattern. It's you just it doesn't have a timing to it, and so you're right. you're always on edge, and it keeps that tension up. You can't pick up on the beats the way that you would in a different movie. And if you'll notice, it's it's really small. I was just going to say the book that she hands is uh, is Kayako's diary, which is the exact same book that Tomoka's script turned into when the tea spilled on it. Yeah, and it's this ratty old book. It's got like blood stains on it when you look inside of it in the other movies and uh in this next scene when they're going through it and uh Keisuke is transcribing it and figuring out what's going on like it looks like the writings of a madman <laughs> like it's yeah this very, no, she's very clearly yeah she seems troubled she has kind of like childlike handwriting we don't get to see it in this movie but in the previous movies when you hear some of what the text actually is and it's it's all about her like stalking this guy and being obsessed with him and how he has uh, an alcohol problem but she walks him home afterward and how uh, she invites herself in and you know this is this affair that leads to the murder because her husband is jealous and possessive and and when he can't have all of her love he kills her and uh, and the kid. And so this obsessive nature and stalking and like she's clearly disturbed prior to becoming a ghost. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of hate directed at uh, the object. The guy's name is Kobayashi, the, the guy that she's kind of in love with from afar. Like they're both married at this point, And there's a lot of her just hating on this dude's wife for existing like yeah really really nasty really uh obsessive stuff and it, it's written very repetitively it's not quite all work and no play but it's it's very <laughs> similar to it yeah yeah it, it's it's wild stuff but uh, the diary is creepy is basically what i'm trying to say <laughs> yeah i uh, seconded so this is also the moment where it does turn into zodiac they're transcribing the diaries and stuff and keisuke is in this office and all of a sudden the printer just starts shooting out page after page and it's just it's a dark blob. Yeah. It's really great. We got some office terror here. <laughs> you get the, the distortion on that scanner on the, on the, the fax machine that I don't like it. It, it unsettles me mm -hmm. and I don't know why, but it, the, the sound effect they do with it as it's printing out just white paper with a black square on it. 
and there's spots of it getting kind of lighter with each in, uh, additional page that comes out. Yeah, it's it's yeah. really really effective. And to Case Case credit, like he he at least buys into this enough to know that shit's going down, and he just pulls the plug on it and just bugs out. He's like, "Fuck this! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. things have started. I am not here for this." And then yeah. if it you gets if you it gets mostly clear, and then he that's when he's like, "Nope, I don't need to see the rest." <laughs> <laughs> trap sprung ghost can't plug it back in anyway see ya but <laughs> this this right here is my favorite scare in the movie if you don't mind like he gets up and he starts bolting out of the room and he stops and there's that, that zoomed out shot of the office i was talking about and there's this window like an office building window it's quite large on the opposite side behind him like we can see but he's not trying to look at it and this reflection this very pale not pale like the ghost but pale like it's not fully there uh, image of Kayako's face, like probably about from just above her eyebrows to just above her upper lip, kind of turns into it, like she's moving forward and turning her head to fit in the window, such as it is. And then the eyes open and they're looking directly at Keisuke. And then he breaks and runs off. And I maybe that's more specific than you wanted to get, but I, this is my favorite scene. I, I'm getting goosebumps talking about it. It gives me the shivers every time I see it. I love that scare. No, I, that's not more specific because that this is exactly what the show is all about. I think that this is a really powerful scare. It's really great. And it's little moments like this where, you know, if you're looking at a synopsis of this story, you're never going to be like, there's a scary moment where you see like part of her reflection and then it locks eyes with him. <laughs> like, But these little moments are what makes a movie good. It, you can't, you can't just get the summary of it and truly experience the movie and and that personal nature of how people are affected by the little moments in horror movies, uh, I think, are is really trying is what I'm trying to communicate with this podcast. So I, I think that that's a perfect illustration of it. Yeah, if if there was any one moment in the whole movie that I wanted to just examine to death, it's that I don't I don't know why, but it's somehow made better by the fact that he is faced away from this window the entire. Time. This is just for us. Like he he never looks back. He just freezes. And then this happens and she's looking at him from behind him and then he just bolts. And I, I love it. It's the best scare I've ever seen in any horror movie ever. It's great. It really is. And from this point, Kyoko and Keisuke are haunted by Kayako and Megumi's ghosts until Kyoko decides to return to the house. And when they get there, uh, Kayako climbs out of the bloodstain. And I'll admit that at first I laughed at this because there's some pretty of the time CGI. Mm -hmm. but, but then as it happens, I'm like, oh wait, this is actually very scary <laughs> because she gets out and she's doing her contortion thing. And this is, you know, you get some of the kind of um, jitteriness of like the fast and slow movement here. And She's just like reaching out at her covered in blood and she has a bloody hand. And I was like, oh yeah, this is, this is scary. <laughs> well, the interesting thing is that this actually isn't Kayako. This is Megumi. Like, oh, this is, this yeah. is back at Kyoko's house and she's asleep at the table and Megumi comes out of the blood stain, which is really weird. And I, I was just, there's a part of me that kind of thought it was weird. Like maybe because she's like part seer, she's like more subsumed by the curse to perpetuate it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, she comes out and she starts reaching across uh, the table to come at Kyoko. And then I think it's the spirit of her mom wakes her up so she doesn't get murdered. I, this yep. was something that kind of I was a little unsure about. That is, that's how you interpret it as well? Yeah, because they have, they have the cut of her, of her mother's shrine. Like they, ha they have yeah. a little like miniature grave. And then, because it's, it's, it's a reveal because Megami comes up and then she starts crawling up at the table and then there's a side cut of Megami's hand coming at Kyoko's hand. And then her mother rises up from behind the table in her normal yeah. sleeping spot. And I love how she says, she says Kyoko and grabs her hand. And right when that happens, Megumi's ghost makes that croaking noise and lurches forward, kind of like, like yeah. trying to get there first. One last and chance, she, yeah. Yeah, she sounds like pissed off. Like she's sure. aggravated that this guardian force is like, not today, bitch. <laughs> yeah, I would be pissed off too. I'm about to murder her. And then her dang mom is like, nope, not my daughter. Yeah, so no, that, oh, that sound though. Ooh. It is creepy. Um, I love it. And so she wakes up and the next scene, they just throw a lot at you. There's a, a girl in a school uniform trying to get out of the grudge house, but the door yep. is locked. And then also Kyoko's baby is trying to erupt out of her gut <laughs> as she yeah. goes into contractions. And Yeah, it's really weird. Yeah, it is. And uh, Kayako crawls down the stairs croaking at her. <laughs> yep. Like just a lot of stuff is happening. And then they just cut to black. 
It's yep. a great way to keep you unsure of what's happening. I have this sign posted in my notes because they, they go to the house and then this, this gets out. And sidebar, I love, I love the way Kaiko whips her head to the left to lock eyes with Kyoko and then Kyoko passes out. Yeah. Um, and then we have uh, vignette six, Chiharu. And in, my, in a parenthetical, I have shit's about to get fucky because yeah. this scene, even if you've seen all the scenes leading up to this and you know who Chiharu is, who is not really anybody of any consequence. She's, she's linked to a previous victim. This scene is, this is all madness. It's, it's, it's the most timey-wimey. It's very back and forth and it deliberately uses the kind of seeds they've planted of, of anachronic order to just make sure you have no idea what or why anything is happening at any one point this entire time. None of this makes sense. And it's either really going to work for you or it's really not going to work for you. I respect it either way. Yeah, it's funny because I, so just to give people a little peek behind the curtain, when I'm preparing for recording an episode, what I'll do is I'll watch the movie, I'll take notes, and then I'll go and find a synopsis of the movie that I can kind of use as a, a reference point for what other people think the big story moments are. Now, in the synopsis of this movie, this vignette gets like two lines, but yeah. <laughs> it's like truly one of the most off the wall things I've ever seen and way more deserving, <laughs> deserving of more uh, investigation than just that. Now, like you said, uh, Chiharu is, she's related to another victim. Uh, she appears in Juon the Grudge, the first one. So she is in the previous and this one. As we're just getting into this vignette, you already get a very disconcerting filter and the editing is really bizarre as it like flies over the area of the camera. And there's, there's just the sound of a gasping woman and there's mm -hmm. this really great sound design in this vignette as you hear like unseen movement and then she runs to the door and you just see Toshio running away in delight. And it kind of made me laugh when you see him running away and you're just like, Oh, it was a dream. Ah, uh, what's real. What's not. Um, <laughs> what is and, life? <laughs> yeah. And then she finds out that she gets to be an extra in the show. And it's very, there's a very cool bit of editing where she steps down while she's having a conversation about getting to be an extra. And then it's immediately her on the stairs in the house um, yeah, I wanted to point that out. They're they're walking home, and then as she one of the steps she takes, it's I don't know, just one of the steps she takes kind of takes her down, and then she's walking downstairs in in the house. Yeah, it's really great, and we see the bit we just saw in the last vignette from her perspective, and oh yep. man, it's like it's a dream again, and then we see she screamed before in the last vignette because she was legit terrified. Also, Toshio is the reason the actor has been touching her belly the whole movie because that's what he's been doing. And there's like three gene sequences that happen in this movie, in this one vignette. And like, you're just, it totally throws you off. It keeps you on edge. And you're like, I don't fully understand what's real and what's not, but neither does she. Because at one point she gets a hold of uh, a necklace from her friend Hiromi, but Hiromi also still has the necklace. And just the editing in the back and forth, back and forth transitions is really spectacular. Yeah, this this alone would uh, it, it keeps you off guard just because it keeps going back and forth different points in time. And so I would definitely say you have if if you would want to, if you're a tireless dork like me, you want to watch this multiple times to see all the extra stuff, like the the effects that it's having, where you know, she does reach out to her friend in the past and pulls her necklace off, and then she wakes up and her friend's talking to her, and it's like. 20 minutes ago before she went to the house in the first place, but she has the chain in her hand still. And it's, it, it's nonstop. Nothing is, nothing is contiguous in this scene at all, but they are, each moment influences the next. Yeah. And so when she freaks out, obviously, and, and when she finally is back in present day, you, you see her trip. She, like, she trips over and, uh, I think it's like a soccer ball is what she trips over. It right? is. Yeah, she trips well, over. She, a she trips ball. in a. Yeah, and it, one rolls up to her. Yeah, and it it rolls up, and then all of a sudden it's Toshio's head. <laughs> yeah, this is this is goofy as fuck. <laughs> yeah, I I did laugh at that. I I will admit, but then he's just sitting there crouching, and we see uh, Chiharu looking at herself dead, and I yep. literally wrote, "Holy crap! Great vignette! Like this this was so fun. It's it, it's not necessarily like." necessary for the story but it's just more 
great scares and more unsettling stuff. And it's exactly what this movie is all about. What blows me away is that they do it again. She, yeah. she trips and she gets up to run and then she finds out that she's a ghost, apparently. She's looking at her own body being held by her friend. And then she starts, this sounds really dumb, but I promise you it works better in, in the movie <laughs> itself. Fans, it does. I recommend you watch. She starts floating away and like this white arm has come across from behind her and is grabbing her torso. You would think that would be the end of it. She got carried off to ghost heaven or whatever. Yeah, Who cares about his luck. life? But she, yeah, she's back in the house again, banging on the door, talking to her friend. And then like camera cut down. Kayako's like got a, a handful of her dress and is kind of looking at Hiromi from under her arm. And then all you hear is her scream and then the door slams. And Hiromi's like, fuck this, I'm out. And she runs past uh, Keisuke and just immediately right into the next one. One other thing that I want to point out about that last little bit is that Hiromi actually sees the necklace that she mm -hmm. had pulled off of her. And, and I think that's a great way of being like, yeah, I would fuck right off if I saw that too. So <laughs> seriously, very reasonable. So just a great vignette. We're in, we're out. The next one is Kayako. So mm -hmm. Kyoko is going into labor. We find out that that's what was happening and that's why she passes out. And Keisuke approaches the house, sees Chiharu trying to get out, but when he enters, finds only Kiyako. He rushes her to the hospital, and her fiancé starts, like, seizing in his wheelchair. This whole scene is rough. Yeah, it and really this is another sort of, like, here, get ready, strap in, gang. Because you're getting a whole lot of stuff right at once. <laughs> she is now in the delivery room, and the baby starts crying, and the lights are flickering. And all of a sudden, friggin' Toshio is just there staring up at her, saying, Mama... And everyone is horrified by whatever they're seeing. And then the fiance throws himself off the roof. <laughs> the director walks in and just sees a litany of dead bodies on the floor of this delivery room, dead from sheer terror. And then uh, Kayako crawls out from inside of Kiyako and friggin' murders his ass. <laughs> like, yeah, no, it's, I, I really want to point out the sound crap. Like, I... I, I am not intending uh, on ever having children. I don't think I have the character for it. I respect the absolute hell out of people who do. I want to say that right now. I, it's not for me. I don't, I, don't, I don't have it in me. But the, it starts out with a baby crying while this is happening. And then it does that same warping distortion that they did with the radio and the copy machine. And it's so much worse. It starts out as like hungry baby actually crying. And then it's like baby screaming. And then it's baby screaming, distorting and muffling and layering over itself. And it's just every time I watch this movie, it's this scene for sure that it just sinks me into my chair. And I'm like, please let it be over. Please let it be over. I, I, I don't like this. Like, I don't think this is related to my not wanting to have children, but I'm open to the possibility. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really intense. And it's a lot going on at once. And then after the death of Keisuke, who does get murdered by uh, Kayako. Rip in uh, peace. Yeah, rip in peace for real, to a, to a real one. And for real. There's another blood stain on the floor. And then there's baby noises in a bloody bag on the ground. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, if, if anyone ever played PT, this is yes, all, it looks oh, a lot like I that. I was just yep. going to say that. It totally yep. reminded me of PT. And <laughs> it's terrifying, very creepy. Daddy was a real drag. <laughs> yeah, the gap in the door. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's, it's wild, it's creepy. You and I might rightly say, absolutely fucking not. Uh, but oh. Kyoko <laughs> picks it up and comforts it. Fade to black. <laughs> yeah, from this point on, from the time she wakes up, mind you, like, Keisuke's been unpersoned. He's been hardcore disappeared. All the birthing staff are still very there and very dead. Yeah. And, like, she wakes up in this dark room. None of the lights are working. Everybody's dead. And from this point on, she has this half-awake look in her eye. And I've never been able to nail down if it's, like, she's possessed or in some way being being controlled or she's not seeing things the way they actually are but for the rest of the movie she is not completely there and she does she picks up this revolting bag that is crying and like oh it's okay i hold you to my face you're my baby and it's like <laughs> honey we gotta talk about a few things yeah right uh bad genetics at the very least <laughs> <laughs> recessive all the yeah. way down <laughs> Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, like you said, she looks like hell, and she continues to look like hell for the whole movie, for the rest of it, but she raises that goddamn kid. <laughs> like, yeah, 
I'm not sure what's going on here. If this is like a, a time lapse to multiple years in the future, or I think it is. I, I I took it as it's like a, a little bit of a jump. It's a couple years later, and yeah, we see her Kyoko and uh, Kyoko, which is kind of reincarnated in this kid. You can tell because she has the diary and she has like the long black hair. Uh, hanging mm-hmm. down in front of her and everything and you're like boy whatever this kid is putting her through is not good for her <laughs> yeah no this this really screws with you too because the 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 baby birthing thing happens and then like literally you don't see her crawl out of her because it's like a side shot but like full-grown ghost kayako that we know comes out of kyoko wastes case gay and then there's a baby left after that so i sh- she reincarnated i guess but like put a pause on that real quick to be adult ghost murderer and then <laughs> yeah. like okay press play on reincarnation i'm ready let's do this <laughs> she's like i can't murder people with tiny little baby hands <laughs> got a loose end here give me one second yeah <laughs> i got this although you can't murder someone with tiny little baby hands it turns out you can murder someone with tiny little child hands because this reincarnated uh, kayako pushes kiyoko down the stairs and she tumbles down gotcha bish <laughs> she's yeah she like a fool it's her own damn fault for taking this kid well yeah it's 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 weird because they're coming up over this overpass and then a train goes by and little girl kind of she's like four right about she took a couple levels you know she's not two yeah. months anymore yeah. she's she's four years old drops her book and she's looking through the thing that the fence and Kyoko's just like, oh, you know, just picks up the, the book like you would after an errant child and then turns around and holds her hand out to like hold her hand. And Kyoko's like, or Kayako's like, deuces down three <laughs> flights of stone stairs. Like, yeah. oh, even the kid, like the little five-year-old kid watching this is like, um, <laughs> yeah, there, <laughs> what is there, happening? There is a spectator. He's not happy about it. <laughs> he just, he runs off. Yeah. He, he takes the long way home after that shit. Oh, yeah. He turns sure right does. around. This rebirth seems to be why Kyoko didn't die in the car crash. At one point, Keisuke speculates that she didn't die on purpose, that she was kept alive for a purpose. And this is why. So that Kayako could keep the curse going, be reborn, uh, and start murdering people. Now, I thought it was pretty funny that Kayako starts to walk off after murdering the kid, after murdering her mom. But her mom is still has like a last breath in her. And she offers mm-hmm. her her scarf. And she's like, oh, we're family. Take my scarf. And the kid is like, no, thank you. Doesn't take it. Walks off. Long black hair still covering her face. The end. Great, yeah, no, I, great ending. I, I love your point about how, like, Case is like, you narrowly avoided death as he's listing everyone else who's super dead. In any other movie where that would mark a character as the chosen one, the final girl, whatever you want to call it, this movie chooses to use that for the person to be hijacked by the main antagonist pretty much literally in the only thing I can think of that I think I might rate worse than being face hugged. I, I would rather have a chest burster than awful ghost baby who keeps me like quasi hypnotized for four years and then shoves me down a flight of stairs when I guess it can fend for itself. I don't know, but it, movie finish is pretty, pretty strong in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. Let's, let's hear from you, the viewer. What would you prefer giving birth to a crazy ghost baby or getting a face hugger on you let us know on twitter (laughs) oh yeah i am here for that poll yeah but yeah so that's the end it's great the whole movie is really great i I think that it's the kind of thing that is easy to kind of get lost in the shuffle i mean there's first of all for an american audience to watch a movie that requires subtitles is already a challenge in a lot of it's an ask for sure yeah so you have that and you have a genre that people in here don't necessarily have a lot of experience with. So there is a huge and intimidating amount of installments, not only in this franchise, but in like this uh, subgenre at large. And so it's really, I think, remarkable that there's just this hidden gem stuck into the middle of the grudge franchise (laughs) like it's it's such an interesting thing to me and i hope that this convinces people to go watch it because it's it was a a joyful surprise to me and i never would have watched it if someone hadn't been like hey i think that this is a great horror movie the best horror movie and i want to talk about it with you and so like i said that kind of personal connection to horror and that recommendation that comes with it of this is something that connects with me is really what this podcast is all about. So 
definitely, I mean, it's very easy to recommend movies like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like Alien, like The Thing, but, you know, stuff like this, I think, is just as worthy of discussion. It's, it's really a great movie the whole way through. So we've reached the point now where we talk about why this is the greatest horror movie ever made. So I, I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about it, but I, I did want to just kind of set that out ahead of time because... It is, we talked about how like confusing the, the titling is and everything, but it's worth the effort, in my opinion. So go ahead and tell us why you think this is the best horror movie ever made. <laughs> well, I, I would like to say that I, I agree with you. I, I like to try to bring something a little different to the table, uh, kind of wherever I am. I hope it doesn't come off as too try-hardy, but I do know that a foreign film like this is a bit of a big ask. But it does a lot of things so way right that, I mean, they may have osmosed more into Western culture now. You can, you can get it on the home shore perhaps more easily than you could get this, but I have no problem saying check this movie out. Only this movie. I don't find any other ones particularly worthy of note, but I, I kind of left a breadcrumb trail of all the stuff that I love most about this movie. I, I love the unflinching looks at the, at the monster. I really love the way that it shoots and conveys isolation and, and helplessness. I love what they do. I love the sound craft of it, the, the, from the copy machine to the, to the birthing scene. Like The sound gets under my skin, and I think it does a really good job of doing that to, to any viewer that I don't think you could get anywhere else. And I mean, at, at its simplest level, like this one still gets me. I love Alien. I love the thing. I, there's a lot of movies that I really love that I can watch no problem, and I still enjoy the hell out of it. But like I said, you know, with the window scare or the, or the birthing scene at the end, like it still gives me goosebumps. It's, there's something about it that I haven't gotten over at like an intrinsic level. And it still has that ability to spook me. And I'll tell you this right now, the night that I watched that I rewatched this for the first time in preparation for the show it was the last thing I did that night. And I went to the bathroom to do my you know, ablutions. And I did something that I haven't done since I was a kid because I watched this movie. And that was, I checked behind the shower curtain. <laughs> Like it made, it made me do that. Everybody has got to be able to identify with that and you outgrow it at a certain point, but still something about this still gets to me. And I was just like, eh? yeah, okay. Time to brush my teeth. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I definitely, I think that you hit the nail on the head. There's so many great elements in this, but at the end of the day, what really makes us the greatest horror movie ever made is that it's scary. It's, there's so much in this that just shakes you to your core. And that's on top of the fact that I like a lot of the performances and I really like the way that it's shot. And I have to say that maybe this has something to do with just my lack of experience with J-horror in, in general. And also the fact that I'm not typically one for just straight up paranormal things, but I've seen a lot of horror at this point. I'm familiar with tropes and with beats that happen in a lot of horror movies. But the tools this, of the trade. Exactly. But this movie kept surprising me. It surprised me like three times that I mentioned in this conversation. There are other small moments that, you know, really keep you on your, on your toes and keep you looking in the background. And I, I know, I mean, just in our talk, you mentioned two different things that happened in the background that I didn't notice. And I really can't wait to go back and watch this again and find more things. And that is the hallmark of a great movie is that desire to go back and rewatch it and to get more out of it, to wring this movie like a sponge and get everything that you can. And, and to me, that makes this the best horror movie of all time. I really want to thank you for bringing it to my attention, James. And I want to thank you for coming on to talk about it with me. This is the part of the show where you get a chance to plug anything if you want, uh, social media channels or anything. Uh, well, I, I have a presence, not much of one, as you might gather by uh, me just now doing my first podcast guesting. And I have to say, uh, delightful experience. I, I really appreciate being, uh, being had on here, aside from the potential nepotism of my, of my brother being my <laughs> in. Uh, hopefully you don't regret it too much. But no, uh, no, if, no. You are, if you are in the neighborhood for uh, political ranting and uh, straight from the hip, I guess, I don't know where game reviews on stuff from 1995. <laughs> uh, I do have a Twitter. It's uh, at make it rainer, make it R-A-Y-N-0-O-R. Uh, you'll know it because it's got the big old picture of Cyclops from the X-Men. Been doing a lot of Cyclops drawing and rewatching the cartoon lately. There you go. But just like this movie, I can't blame you if you end up firing that Twitter into the sun. If it's not for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, definitely give him a follow. I know uh, that I am looking forward to seeing some more of those drawings, but it was really great. As far as my plugs, you can find me and the show on Twitter at Gerg Hef and at uh, Little Horror PHL. 
Uh, we're also on Facebook and Instagram. Do us a favor, review and rate us, please. It does us a lot of benefit in terms of just getting it in front of people. And uh, I think that we're doing good work and I would like people to hear it. So give us, give us that rating. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, that's, I mean, that's pretty much it for me. Thanks again for coming on and uh, hope everyone has a good night. Bye.